Matters. Extra, extra. The scoop on copyright and the news. Please welcome acting register Karen Temple. Thank you very much. Welcome to the 19th Copyright Matters event. Copyright Matters was launched in 2012 by former register Maria Palante to discuss and highlight the importance of copyright in our everyday lives. Since then, we have had 18 events highlighting such topics as copyright in the American songwriter, best practices in fair use, and women in innovation and creativity. Today, we are excited to have an event highlighting the relationship between copyright and journalism. Extra, extra, the scoop on copyright in the news. With that, I will turn it over to Associate Register for Public Information and Education, Katie Rowland, who will say a little bit more about our program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, and thank you everyone for joining us. Today we are going to be talking about the unique relationship between journalism and the free press and copyright. Most of you are familiar with the importance of the free press to our country. It's enshrined in the First Amendment of our Constitution, and as Bill Moyers noted, the quality of our democracy and the quality of journalism are deeply entwined. What you may not be as familiar with, however, is the relationship between copyright and journalism. Copyright and journalism have, in fact, grown up together. The first Copyright Act, the Statute of Anne, back in 1709, was paved the way for publishers to print without fear of censorship by the king. After that, the founding farmers of our country took note when they were creating our Constitution. They established the First Amendment, as well as the Progress Cause, which allowed Congress to go ahead and make copyright legislation, of which we've had quite a bit in this past week or so. In the intervening years, copyright and journalism have maintained their relationship. Over the years, publishers and journalists have used copyright to be able to fund their endeavors and their business models, and they have also worked with copyrighted materials themselves. Journalism and copyright are, have a unique relationship in that journalists and news reporters often use the works of others as well as create their own. The Copyright Act is, is, is made so that it will deal with this issue pretty easily. It has exempted facts from coverage under copyright so that as many journalists and photographers who want can go ahead and report on the news of our day. And the Copyright Act spe specifically singles out news reporting as something that may be fair use under the Copyright Act. Today we're going to talk about how copyright law and journalism are working today, the challenges that they face, the benefits that are happening, and the new age of the internet. I'm going to introduce Brad Greenberg, who is our moderator today. He's a lawyer here at the Copyright Office, but that's his second career. He previously was a reporter for five years, so I'm going to welcome him up to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Brad. Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at the Library of Congress. Uh, the Copyright Office is thrilled to be doing this event, and I can say personally, I am too, as, as Katie mentioned. Uh, this is a um, unique intersection of my interests, and it is a pleasure and a delight to welcome uh, the panel we have here today to discuss uh, the issue of copyright and the news with you. Uh, I'm going to start by just giving a brief introduction for those here. Um, on my right is Jonathan Band. Jonathan is a tech law and policy advocate. Uh, he has represented clients with respect to numerous federal and state laws that, are, uh, that uh, deal with intellectual property and the internet, um, and also uh, in the international arena, treaties and trade agreements, uh, the Marrakesh Agreement, which was just um, signed into law last week, Jonathan uh, was very involved in, um, as were many at this office. Um, Jonathan is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center and has written extensively on IP and the internet. And in 2017, he received the ALA's uh, L. Ray Patterson Copyright Award, which recognizes an individual who has supported the constitutional purpose of copyright law, fair use, and the public domain. To Jonathan's right is Michael Carroll. Michael is a professor of law and director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property at American University's Washington 
College of Law. His research and teaching specialties are intellectual property and cyber law, and he focuses on the search for balance in the face of challenges posed by new technologies. <clears throat> as uh, Michael will discuss a little, he also is a founding member of Creative Commons, and he serves on the board of directors of the Public Library of Science. Uh, to Michael's right is Sharon Farmer. Sharon served as director of the White House Photography Office from 1999 to 2001, and before that, uh, she had been at the White House for six years as a photographer. Um, Karen, uh, sorry, Sharon has been a professional photojournalist for 40 years and has shot news stories, political campaigns, cultural events, conferences, and portraits um, for the likes of the Washington Post, the Smithsonian Institution, and numerous others. In 2016, Sharon received the Karsh Award at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. To Sharon's right is Robert Levine. Robert is a journalist who writes about the digital media business as well as copyright law and piracy, I'm sorry, privacy. He is the author of Free Ride, How Digital Parasites Are Destroying the Culture Business and How the Culture Business Can Fight Back, and has spoken about online legal issues in DC, London, Brussels, and Berlin. He frequently writes for, he frequently writes for Billboard, where he was previously executive editor and has contributed to such publications as the Vanity Fair, Fortune, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and numerous others. To Robert's right at the end of our panel is Tom Curley. Tom is a former newspaper journalist like myself who also made the interesting decision to go to law school. Uh, he now serves as Associate General Counsel for Gannett, which is one of the largest newspaper companies in the country. Uh, Gannett publishes USA Today and more than 100 local news sites. Tom is responsible for advising journalists with respect to libel, access, copyright, and First Amendment matters. Tom also manages the company's content-related litigation. So with that, um, the panel is each going to spend five to seven minutes or so discussing uh, an issue related to copyright and the news that they are interested in or they want to share with you. And after that, we're going to discuss as a panel um, a little more, and then we're going to have to audience questions. So uh, with that, I believe Michael is going to start us off. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I was asked to talk a little bit about this relationship between um, <coughs> copyright and news gathering. And, and I think as both Karen and Katie got us started, uh, it is true that uh, the Copyright Act imagines that we're going to promote the progress of science and useful arts by giving authors exclusive rights. The power of those exclusive rights is necessary for certain publishing models. Certainly if you publish a book today and someone else can publish the same book tomorrow, we have a problem. With news gathering, the relationship's a little bit different economically because the economic value of the news is that it's current. And so if you were to republish my newspaper tomorrow, that's less of a business threat to me. Uh, and so copyright is not playing as essential a role in that, in that uh, manner. And so historically, newspapers were not spending time registering their claims to copyright. And in fact, uh, it's technology that made copyright become more relevant to the news gathering business. Um, in the I International News Service versus Associated Press case, where news stories were first being telegraphed back from Europe during World War I, the International News Service was grabbing those stories off a commonly shared board and telegraphing that out to the Western United States ahead of the Associated Press, even though these were Associated Press stories. A lawsuit followed, but it was not a copyright infringement suit. And, and the Supreme Court created a quasi-property right in the news, which meant that you could exclude your news gathering competitors from using even the facts, but not using, uh, <clears throat> but, but the rest of us could use the news. It was free as the air, as the court would say. That evolved, though, with the, the telegraph and other electronic communications made the competitive risk of uh, copying more salient. and so news gathering organizations started to rely more on, on copyright vis-a-vis -vis their competitors. And that became more intense as we got the internet. So in the early days of the internet, as, as uh, news gathering organizations had to figure out how to publish digitally while continuing to serve some of us old dinosaurs who still like the broadsheet, um, they realized that they had uh, these sort of competitors like the, the Free Republic, which said, well, let's just take news stories and show that there's a left-wing bias in the media by republishing news stories and then commenting on them. And a number of organizations successfully sued, saying that entire republication was not a fair use, even if your goal was uh, a comment and criticism. 
Total News created a sort of a frame around the website of news sites and sold ads in the frame, but adding no new value themselves, and they also were shut down. So copyright was important for some of these digital competitors, um, but it's still an ad-supported business at, at its root in the modern 20th century, and so it's a mix of the exclusive rights plus the access to advertising, and a lot of the stress on the modern news gathering business model is, comes more from the change in the market for digital advertising than it does from your ability to exclude your competitors. Um, nonetheless, it remains incredibly important, uh, and we see that we have different kinds of models. The ad-supporting model creates lots of fit clickbait, which has very little content and lots of ads, and we see the New York Times figuring out a business model where they've increased subscriptions that rely on the exclusive rights of copyright as a necessary part of the ability to sell news uh, to subscribers. So we have this mix, uh, and I, I think a lot of organizations are struggling to figure, figure that out. Two quick other notes, and then I'll pass it on. But within the industry, copyright has also played a really important role, uh, because you have employees who, under the work made for hire, uh, create copyrighted works that are owned by the news organization. But you have a lot of freelancers and stringers who are independent contractors who may own their own copyrights and sign agreements with the uh, news organizations, and that's how they get paid. Because they are authors under the Copyright Act, they own the rights. It is the ability to transact over those rights that allows freelancers and stringers to have the leverage to be able to get paid and for the news organization to have a, a smaller uh, footprint. So when we see other digital transition problems, the Tassini case involves uh, a right under the Copyright Act of publishers of collective works to revise those automatically without having go, to go back and revisit those contracts. The question was, when you take all of those print publications and put them in a digital database, does that count as a revision or not? And a number of freelance authors sued the New York Times and other, uh, other publishers saying that it was not. They won the battle, but maybe not the war, with respect to the relationship with their publishers. Uh, so I hope to have more to say, but the last thing I just want to say is, um, we'll hear more about this, but the thing I love about this topic, and thanks to the Copyright Office for doing this, is that uh, copyright and journalism shows the importance of the exclusive rights to support some aspects of the business model. It also shows the importance of needing the ability to use the works of others through, through quotation and other uses that uh, we call fair use. And so uh, exclusive rights and fair use live side by side in the journalism model. Um, and we know that uh, the ability to quote has been uh, an important right, but it does have its limits. And I think Jonathan's going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I will just say it's an ironic thing that in the nation case, uh, it was the quotation of Gerald Ford's rem, uh, memoir that caused the court to say they had gone too far, and many may not remember, but the same thing happened again with Hillary Clinton's first memoir after the Clinton White House, where again an excerpt of her book was uh, printed and we had exactly the same lawsuit. I thought that was interesting. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, well, thank you, Michael, and uh, that actually is a great segue to Sharon Farmer, who worked in the Clinton White House for eight years, and has also been a freelancer before and since then. And now that they're scaring me about copyright and about what can happen with your work, when you work for government, you're not worried about that because you know it belongs to y'all. It's about you, the taxpayer. So America owns my work that I've done in the White House. As time goes on and you look back at what you've done, you go, well, that's historical. Here we are having lunch with uh, Netanyahu and Arafat with the King of Jordan, and President Clinton had orchestrated this. Well, they wouldn't talk to each other. So they sit down, have a few pleasantries, pull the napkins out, put them on their thing. Then I watch the president look at the King of Jordan, and King of Jordan looks at the president, and the president gets up. Okay, we're gonna leave you guys here to figure it out. Enjoy your lunch. And Netanyahu and Arafat are like, hmm. And as we all leave, President Clinton's telling the Secret Service, nobody goes in. I don't care if it's their guys or not, they don't go in. And then we all go out, and we leave them in there an hour and a half by themselves. Things got better. 
the wonderful thing about being on this kind of job is you really understand, begin to appreciate people who get it, that government matters. If you don't vote, you don't have a nickel and a quarter. And here I am documenting all this stuff. I'm a fly on the wall. I'm also the furniture, so you don't talk to the furniture so I can get my stuff done. This is at the UN, Nelson Mandela, and then the gentleman who was gonna take his place in South Africa, we're walking through the halls of uh, the UN. These two got along gratefully all the time, and he always had ways to talk to people who did not wanna talk to them. President Clinton is one of the most friendliest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, if you put barriers up so he can't go somewhere, he steps across them. On the Air Force One, that's like a big flying office building. But it's a fun office building because we're on a mission. We're trying to get stuff done. So I get to take pictures of people who work around the president, who work for the president, for people who have issues. Am I worrying about copyright? No. I'm worrying about history. And the wonderful thing about it, as old as I get, we get to go back to places I started at. This is when the Indiana, Cleveland, Cleveland Indians uh, dedicated their new uh, stadium in Cleveland. And the guy on the left is Michael White, who was mayor at the time. Well, Michael went to Ohio State with me. And it's nothing like going, yeah, I did good. I'm telling Michael he did good. And he's like, you with him? You did good too, Sharon. When you come back home from every trip, everything you've done, all through your career, I've taken pictures of everything, including this great panther here, who was bad. She helped make sure the seniors had Medicaid and Medicare. Now, when I shot this picture back in the 70s, I wasn't worried about copyright. Am I now? Uh-huh, why is that? Facebook, things keep happening, and you're like, you're kidding. Now, what am I doing now? Sharon, you need to make a pile of everything you want to copyright so you don't have to worry about it. So that keeps me up in the weird hours of the night. From one o'clock to four o'clock, four days a week, I'm up sifting through what I call the old stuff. But the old stuff is important stuff because it's the history of the community, of the nation, but yet my stuff from the president lives on in the archives. The presidential library, am I worried about that stuff? Mm -mm. Am I worried about my stuff? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think Robert Levine now uh, is going to talk a little more about uh, what Sharon is worried about. That's, that's a tough act to follow. That's a tough act to follow. I, I felt like I should have been introduced on the panel as the, the journalist who wasn't smart enough to, to go to law school. Um, not, not smart, hopefully not smart enough, but not um, sort of savvy enough to see which way the winds were blowing. Um, I wanted to start out with a, a quick story. A few years ago, I wrote a book called Free Ride, generally in defense of the importance of copyright. Um, I, I think it's right in some ways and wrong in others, which is, I guess, about average for predicting the future. But right when it came out, I think in 2011, I met a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Um, you know, I, I knew him already, he congratulated me on the book. And he said, you know, I'm a little surprised that you're so conservative in your views on the media business. You know, what about the sort of the world of Wikipedia, collective creation, citizen journalism, all this stuff that at the time was pretty exciting. It, it still is pretty exciting. I think we're more realistic about it now. It's important, but it's not everything. You know, he said, well, musicians will make money on tour. I said, what about writers? He said, writers will make money speaking about their books. I'll pause here to add that I'm not being paid, and, I'm, and I, paid, I'm, I came here on my own dime. Um, so that hasn't really been such a great, um, anyway. Um, I asked him about newspapers. I said, he said, you know, citizens can gather news, and that's true. I said, what about Iraq? He said, people, that, you know, people there will document what's going on around them. Don't Iraqis understand what's going on in Iraq better than the Americans? That's probably true. And I said, but wait a minute. You know, if no one's making money from news, you know, we think of the news as a public good, and it is, but it, it's a living to some people. 
Not a great living, but it's a living. You need that incentive that copyright provides. What happens without that? Won't opening news to everyone lead to a lot of propaganda? How do you know the person who says he's reporting from Iraq, the Iraqi reporting from Iraq, is reporting accurately? How do you know he's even in Iraq? Could be a, was it a 400 pound guy from New Jersey? You never know. He said I was cynical. Well, maybe so. I want to make clear, I didn't predict any of our current troubles with the media. It would have been beyond me to even try. There's a lot of things about the world that I, today that I think are sort of unpredictable. But there is a point here. Over the years, there's been a lot of talk about how the news business didn't need copyright as much anymore. Everything was going to be free online. And all of these forces were going to remake the news business, foundation-based journalism, citizen journalism. And I think that those things are important. They've done a lot of good. ProPublica is fantastic. Wikipedia is fantastic. There's a lot of great stuff. But I think that even now, in 2018, the model of for-profit news is surprisingly dominant. If you look at the major scoops this year, a lot of them have been in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Old newspapers, broadsheets, read by, you know, not spring chickens, shall we say. The <laughs> upward demographic. You know, once you're over 34, advertisers just lose interest. And it's interesting, you know, this idea that bloggers were going to change things. Bloggers have changed things. But the, the discussion about what's going on is still largely driven by print media, or media that originates in print. I don't even know what to call it, because most people are reading it online. Um, and a lot of that is driven by profit, which, which is the incentive that copyright is supposed to create. Um, I'll just tell another story, and then I'll talk a bit about how that business is changing. In 2010, when I was reporting the book, I went to the ASNI convention, the American Society of Newspaper Editors. Picture 2010. Eric Schmidt was the keynote speaker, talked about how much Google was going to help the newspaper business. Most of the editors applauded. They didn't ask any tough questions. At one of the panels, a, a staffer from the FTC talked about how excited she was about all the innovation in journalism. The, an entrepreneur called Patrick Byrne, who ran Overstock.com, was starting a new investigative business journalism site called DeepCapture.com and everyone sort of nodded. Well, if you know about Patrick Byrne and Overstock.com, you might be able to guess what was on the news site that he funded. It was mostly investigations that were not entirely true about journalists that were reporting on him. I'm not gonna say what Patrick Byrne does or why, because he's a li very litigious man and, you know, I. I don't know if any of these lawyers would defend me for nothing, but so I'll just leave it at there, but you can decide whether that's a, whether that's a good thing. I, I, I don't want to knock this too much. I don't, I don't want to make fun of it. I mean, there has always been news done for partisan reasons by people who wanted to set an agenda. I don't think we could stop that. I don't think we want to. I don't think we could legally under the First Amendment. But I think it's important that for-profit news continue to exist. And I think that copyright supports that. The main way copyright supports that is through advertising. Increasingly now, we're talking about selling content. And it, you know, if you remember a few years ago, when the New York Times put up a paywall, people acted like it was the end of the New York Times. What's going to happen to these guys? Now it's half their revenue. And I think what, what Michael said was very important, which is that the tradition of the news business was a lot of the reporting done by the print media always supported other businesses. Time Magazine started out summarizing a lot of newspapers. Drive Time Radio in a lot of cities, they're essentially summarizing the newspapers. This was never a big issue because they weren't competing to sell the same ads. Now they are. Time Magazine, the New York Times, that drive time radio show, they're all, they're all selling online ads. 
many of them to a similar audience in a similar format, suddenly copyright becomes a lot more important. And I think that um, fair use and exceptions and limitations are very important. You know, as, as a journalist, I take advantage of them all the time. At the same time, there, there is this idea that, um, you know, fair use is, you know, it's called an exception for a reason. You know, people have an idea of fair use where we're gonna take that photo and put it in a scroll through collection of photos and that's transformative. Maybe not. You wanna have a situation where photographers and journalists can get paid for their work so they're incentivized to do more of it. It doesn't only keep writers and photographers and newspapers creating, it also keeps those other sites that depend on them healthy. Great, thank you, Robert. I think um, Jonathan now is gonna talk a little more about exceptions and limitations in copyright that are relevant and how they support uh, journalism. Thank you very much. So uh, what I'll do is, is amplify a little bit on some of the various themes that, that uh, some of the previous speakers have alluded to. So we have, in copyright, you have a balance. On the one hand, you have the exclusive rights that are, are granted under the Copyright Act, but then you also have exceptions and limitations. And that, uh, especially in the news business, those exceptions and limitations are critical. So the most important one, which people have alluded to, is the fact that copyright protects expression, but not facts. So the, the fact you know, of, of what the score was in the football game last night, uh, the, you know, when, when the Patriots uh, uh, were, were playing against the Chiefs, yeah, and, and won by three points. Okay, that is a fact. And now certainly the article that explains, you know, the, the details of the game, again, any fact in that article is, uh, is free and other people can use it, but the expression of those facts is not uh, protected, and that's critical because, again, as we've heard, you know, we've have all, we have all these scoops over the past year by uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Well, but everyone else then can write about those scoops, can build on those scoops, or and certainly can investigate and follow on and so forth. Uh, the, the Post and the Times don't own those facts; those facts belong to all of us. And that's uh, uh, again, you, you can't have a news industry. Uh, if, if you can't have other people using the facts c uncovered uh, by, by, other, uh, uh, by other organizations. Now, M M Mike correctly alluded to the, the issue of the hot news doctrine. Okay, that's outside of copyright. Uh, it's also more recent case law calls into question whether the hot news doctrine still exists. But, but um, uh, you know, that was also a very specific example of uh, uh, you know, people sort of copying just not individual facts, but whole, you know, the, the entire uh, AP news feed uh, and, and retransmitting it as such uh, without, you know, really developing their own stories and investing any additional uh, labor and effort. But again, the, the, the key is that excluding facts from protection are critical to the copyright industry. Similarly, you have the idea expression dichotomy. So that even when you're, that, 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 that uh, copyright protects, again, the expression, but not the ideas. So, um, and again, the, 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 you know, these are all sort of metaphysical distinctions that copyright lawyers love, but the, 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 the fact that, again, ideas, um, various uh, uh, concepts and principles that are articulated by one person or one organization, one newspaper, let's say the editorial, in one newspaper where someone else can, uh, can, can use some of those ideas uh, in a subsequent publication. And that's, again, critical for a healthy ecosystem. Now, one, one uh, ironic little wrinkle here is when you're, th there, is, there is case law that suggests that, um, well, whereas discovered facts are not protected by co copyright, created facts might be protected by copyright. Um, and so, in other words, fake news might be copyrightable, whereas, you know, the real news, uh, uh, the real facts might not be. But that's a discussion for a, a, another day. Um, just a couple of other exceptions that have been mentioned. Uh, we heard Sharon talking about U.S. government works, and that, again, is an incredibly important 
to the, the vitality of uh, the news industry that, that works that are created by U.S. government employees can be freely used. Uh, so it's whether it's the photographs that Sharon took while she worked at the White House uh, or uh, the, the U.S. government publications that, uh, that are uh, used by, by journalists. Again, having that limitation is critically important. Uh, another uh, limitation that is essential in the, in the digital age, we've talked a little bit about it, it's the, the safe harbors under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. That allows a platform to uh, allow uh, other organizations, let's say news organizations, uh, have websites. So it's not necessarily citizen journalists. You know, we can, again, that's the subject for another panelist about how, panel, about how effective that may or may not be. But it's certainly uh, uh, the fact that an organization can have a website and thereby achieve uh, wide distribution, it significantly lowers the cost for people to enter the news business. Now, again, still, if they want to do it professionally, they need to find a, a, a business model. They need to find a revenue source, and it might be advertising, it might be something else. Uh, but certainly, the ability to have a website that then uh, reaches a large audience is, uh, uh, at low cost, is, is, is a, 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 a fantastic development. I mean, the number of professional bloggers and professional news channels, again, who knows how much money they necessarily make, but they seem to be making enough money for them to exist. That can only exist by having platforms that allow them to uh, host, to upload their web, their content, and again, that in turn typically relies on uh, these safe harbors so that the platform is not secondarily liable uh, or, 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 or it, 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 it sort of defines the secondary liability of those platforms uh, for that content, and again, that reduces the cost significantly of distribution. Um, the, the final point I want to make uh, it, we're, about how copyright exceptions play an important role in, in the ecosystem, and particularly relevant to us being here at the Library of Congress, is that uh, you always hear that, that uh, 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 newspapers are the first, uh, the first draft of history. Um, but it's a critical draft of history uh, because later historians go back and look at newspapers to find out what people were talking about and thinking about at a given time. But they can only do that if the newspaper is preserved. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it's one thing if the newspaper is still around, it might have archives, but more likely a lot of these newspapers, certainly smaller newspapers, go out of business. And it's the library that preserves them, and a library preserves them uh, uh, by copying them, by making, in the old days it was uh, microfiche, but now it's making digital reproductions and there are exceptions and limitations that uh, relate to that. Now, other people have mentioned fair use. Uh, I'm just going to say it's really important and then kick it over to Tom to explain why it's so important. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, um, as Brad said, so I started out as a, a newspaper reporter, worked for a couple of newspapers, and then I died and went to law school, and uh, <laughs> I came back and I'm now uh, working for a, a newspaper company called Gannett, which publishes USA Today and about a hundred other titles, and they publish in places like Cincinnati and Des Moines, Indianapolis, Bergen County, New Jersey, Phoenix, Arizona, all over the country. And in some ways, what we do is very different from uh, the big city newspapers. So. Just to give a little perspective and to talk a little bit about fair use too, uh, as you may have picked up from what other folks were saying, th there's a bit of a tension for media companies and journalists when it comes to copyright because we can't live without it in terms of protecting uh, what we create. But on the other hand, we are uh, one of the, uh, an entity that relies on fair use, on taking things that are out in the world and making them our own, uh, perhaps uh, more than any other creator, or certainly uh, uh, among the, the creators who to take uh, the greatest advantage of fair use. So, and it's very important that uh, facts can't be copyrighted. It's very important that we can uh, report on things we haven't witnessed firsthand or digest um, you know, the, uh, the things that are first reported by others, and on and on it goes. We can't live without fair use, but on the other hand, we can't live without some degree of, of protection for our own product. So, 
Uh, you know, as the saying goes, may you live in interesting times. There are very interesting times for media companies now and newspapers in particular because of the rise of the platforms of Google and Facebook, which isn't intended as a criticism of them. If I had thought of Google, I'd be on an island today instead of uh, up here, and I'd probably own that island. So they deserve credit for what they've accomplished. But it's somewhat unique in terms of what the situation is, which is to say there is a dwindling number of folks who are still passionate about print. I'm glad some are still on the stage with me. Um, but most people get their news online, right? And most people get their news not only from your website that they may or may not encounter, the website of USA Today, usatoday.com, or, or one of the other uh, local entities, but they may get it through Google or Facebook. And Google, <coughs> excuse me, and Facebook are largely immune um, due to federal law from libel suits. In other words, they can pass the news on without uh, incurring any risk for uh, libel or privacy for doing so, and they're largely immune from copyright suits. Not completely, but, but largely. So they're in a, uh, a good position, a position that we're not. We're proud to stand behind our journalism and defend libel suits, and believe me, I do plenty of that, but it's, uh, it, they're in a different position. The other thing that's different is the advertising model. Uh, when I started, we, our distribution vehicle was usually a truck and a bunch of burly fellows who, you know, brought that truck to a central point that was then handed out to the, the, uh, the, the people who delivered it to your door, right? And if you wanted to buy an advertisement, you had to talk to us. So that was a good position to be in. Now, the advertising model, most of the digital advertising is, is going to the platforms and the media companies are only getting a, a small part of that. Again, it's not intended as a criticism of Google or Facebook. They, uh, they've come up with a model that uh, they've built a better mousetrap and people want it. But what's the effect of that? The effect of that is a real challenge for newspapers to finance the kind of journalism that I think the people in this room want. And I I'm not so worried about uh, the Washingtons or New Yorks of the world or the uh, uh, you know, the, the, the big cities in terms of whether uh, a single newspaper can survive and thrive, really, or whether there'll be a benevolent uh, billionaire who wants to purchase one or start a, uh, a nonprofit uh, to do investigative journalism. But I'm worried about more the cities outside of, uh, of the largest cities in the United States and what they need, so, uh, and what they need to thrive. The kind of journalism that people want and need and deserve is very expensive to produce. And to give you an example, I don't know if how many of you are familiar with the uh, story about the team physician for USA Gymnastics who was accused of uh, sexually abusing uh, hundreds of young women. Are you familiar with that story? I mean, it was a huge national story, right? And the doctor was uh, convicted to spend the rest of his life behind prison. That story, I, I doubt most of you know, or, or maybe any of you, was broken by the Indianapolis Star, which spent months investigating, talking to gymnasts, going through court filings and lawsuits that have been brought by uh, gymnasts who had claims. They broke that story, and it led directly to hundreds of other women coming forward and to the indictment and, and conviction of this doctor. And I would say the reason they did that story was because the particular gymnastics federation was based in Indianapolis. And that's the kind of story that I fear won't get done without the resources uh, behind it to do that, that only a vigorous local publication that's not afraid of, of going after big stories can accomplish. So I wish I had a wonderful solution to, to how we uh, fix the business model or improve upon it. Um, maybe some of my colleagues on stage will have ideas for that. But I, but I, there isn't any doubt in my mind that it's important and that it's important to a democratic society and that if we figure out the right way to do it, people will pay for it. So um, I actually have a different opening question for the panel, but before I get to it, I do want to actually start with what Tom was just talking about because this is something that I've, I've published a few articles on um, business models and, and legal mechanisms for um, the newspaper industry, in the news industry, but really newspapers, because those continue to be the primary gatherers of new information 
Um, and the real interest here being, as Tom's talking about, the news that no one wants to pay for, the news that doesn't get paid for because it doesn't generate national or international clicks, um, but you know, local news, investigative news, stuff that's costly and stuff that has, may have a narrow interest. So the, the question I have is, what role does copyright play uniquely in the story of news being local? It's everything. If you don't have local news, why on earth do you want to watch people go from coast to coast being crazy? When you got stuff right in your own backyard that needs your attention. Um, details in communities are still the most important thing. It helps us to grow up to be good citizens. It makes us read. If we have to only deal with the New York Times and the Washington Post, a lot of wonderful little people get left out of the equation about how things are done. What kind of goals can we set if the community paper is not pushing good stuff? Well, and I think that, that what I was talking about, the platforms uh, and the safe harbors for the platforms is a critical piece of that because, uh, you know, in, I live in, in, in Rockville and uh, so there's a, a, a local website, uh, that, a website, it's not a local website, I mean, it's accessible everywhere, of course, but it's, uh, there, there's a website that sort of focuses on uh, Bethesda and Rockville and, and other areas of Montgomery County. Um, it's a two or three person operation. In the past, it probably would have been a much bigger operation, uh, but it's able to survive with two or three people because you know, they, don't, they don't have to worry about distribution. I mean, they don't have to have the, the burly guys. They don't have to print. I mean, they just are able to upload things directly. Now, they can cover all of the sort of short term local news pretty well you know, the local football games and, you know, the, the, uh, what's happening with the White Flint Mall and so forth. Uh, I don't know about the long -term, longer term investigative journalism. I mean, that piece, they might, in the, you know, I'm not sure they would have done that in the past either, but that might be more of an issue. Um, so, so part of the solution is the, the maintaining the safe harbors that allow the platforms to allow this very low cost production and distribution but you still need to, to find new business models. Advertising might be one, foundations might be another. Um, but, but I think at least it seems that where copyright would come into play is, is making sure that uh, the platforms are able to uh, make space available uh, without liability. I think one of the problems with local news is that it's harder to sell. Think about the news people are willing to pay for. You, you know, the Times and the, and, the, and the Washington Post have had pretty good success with paywalls. Um, local news, and I'm extending that to city papers, you know, Kansas City, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, it's harder to charge. And it's also, you know, if you think about the ad base that supported those papers, I don't know the business in detail off my head, but there was a sense, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post were running a lot of national ads, movie openings, stuff like that. They were competing with magazines and television. The Cincinnati paper, the Phoenix paper, they were running a lot of ads that national media, they weren't well suited for national media. You know, the, the Toyota ad that was a co-op with the Toyota dealership, the, the local department store not you know, the, the fashion ad that's a co-op with the local department store, whatever the department store in that, in that city is, they had that business to themselves. That's not the case anymore. If you're on Google, or if you're on Google or Facebook looking at national news from Cincinnati, they can serve you up that ad equally well. Those papers don't have much protection. And, and the other thing, and, and I don't have an answer to this, you know, like every journalist, I, I rely on, you know, my work is built on the work of other journalists intellectually. I, I, don't, I don't copy anything <laughs> more than I'm supposed to, but, you know, I, I rely on, on other work to give what I do context, just like everyone does. But if you look at something like what the Indianapolis Star did, that took, I'm assuming that took months, maybe more than one person. That's an enormously expensive undertaking. And, you know, it's, it's especially relevant to Indianapolis. I knew that that paper broke the story. I had no idea why. You now see that story in Vanity Fair and the New York Times. People who are reading that story, most Americans, they're getting that news from 
honestly, whoever games the Google search results the best. So what is in it for the Indianapolis Star to invest so much in that reporting, knowing that they're not getting as much out of it as other entities? That's a very tough question. It, it, it probably sort of supersedes this idea of the platforms, because you're also talking about other journalistic institutions. But it's something that really is especially pressing now, because those competitive barriers are gone. It's like everyone against everyone. The online advertising business is really brutal. Yes, yeah, so I think that's all true. Uh, I, I think we face challenges. Uh, and, and there are other issues at work, as you said. The department stores that used to be dominant are uh, facing Amazon. Yeah, and what local department stores, exactly. I should have said, yeah. <laughs> well, there are a few. There but, used to be these. Uh, but, I mean, bringing it back to copyright, and I, I don't mean to suggest this is uh, necessarily imminent or even a solution, but you are starting to see, for example, in Europe, the idea of a publisher's copyright, a, a license for that little digest, the two or three lines in the headline and the, the thumbnail photograph. And that's one idea they've turned to there. Another issue that lurks in that the, uh, the News Media Alliance, which is the uh, uh, trade organization that represents the news media, has looked at is, you know, uh, collective action in terms of being able to uh, uh, negotiate advertising rates with the platforms. You know, that would require an antitrust exemption to do so. But those are, are both different ways of getting at the same issue, which is uh, increasing a dedicated revenue stream to make this kind of journalism possible. If I can just throw in, I think, um, you, you know, I, I'm worried about this press publisher's right in Europe because it's asking copyright to solve a problem that's really based on the advertising market. And, and it's, you know, that press publisher's right was tried in Germany and in Spain, and it did not produce revenues because Google just said, if you don't want your publication in Google News, that's fine. And then suddenly, oh, wait, I do want my publication in Google News. So the press publisher's right says, you have to put them in Google News, and then you have to pay for it, which is, I don't think, a law we're going to get in the US. I, I think this is really hard. I think um, taking the point that each creator of local news is an author and thinking about different business models in which you can get groups of authors to be able to work together and have enough financial incentive um, would be the future. I think using technology, artificial intelligence, and other sort of data-driven journalism where if we had local governments that had to produce public records in ways that AI could digest, that we could use AI to um, sort of do the first pass and find the patterns that then make it worth uh, something's funny here and let's go investigate. But it's still not going to solve the revenue problem unless people are willing to pay. And they're either going to pay with their eyeballs or with their pockets. Um, and maybe some ability to aggregate the content would make people, and, and maybe combine it with your internet service. I mean, there, there are other ways to think about doing this, but some form of bundling strikes me as the way to get people to pay, because having to pay for all these different streaming services and all these different content uh, units is not likely to be sustainable. So we were talking before this program began, and I, I mentioned that I entered journalism in 2004, and these were sort of the last days of pretty outrageous profit margins for most newspapers, and, and the, nobody has those profit margins anymore. Uh, they maybe had them for a few years after by selling lots of properties, selling buildings, selling papers, uh, selling staff into retirement, right? But now, um, you know, newspapers and news organizations, and this is across the board really, um, uh, are struggling. Um, it's not just copyright, right? We'd, we'd be really uh, narrow-minded to suggest that this, because this is a copyright office event, that this is all about copyright. There are other challenges um, and changes um, there's been quite a few people have mentioned um, the changes in subscriptions and in uh, ad rates. Uh, we, the, the phrase I always think of is digital dimes versus print dollars. Um, the value is just not there as much because even though the ad is more targeted, the eyes aren't as, aren't as captive. Um, but uh, in the past 20 years, I'd like to, the panel to discuss how um, news organizations and individual journalists have changed their understanding of the importance of copyright law to news and how much that's had to do with changes in technology and how much that has had to do with changes in business models. I'd like to, 
when you talk about the understanding individual journalists have of copyright, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say... Yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm going to say that there, you shouldn't presume that individual journalists have any understanding of copyright. You know, journalists, because of sort of... I, I don't want to say that a group of people has a systemic bias, but I do think certain occupations give you a certain way of looking at the world. I, not that everybody looks at it that way, but there's a tendency. Journalists tend to be First Amendment absolutists. And I think that's healthy and natural, but it also, in some ways, can give you a pretty poor understanding of what the journalism business is about. You know, when I talk to other journalists, they think that, you know, they're gonna sell ads harder. If only the ad sales guy would, would sort of sell harder, everything would be fine. And that's just really not the way it works. You know, you were talking about the, there's a relationship between copyright and these other, these other concepts, these other areas of law. The New York Times knows, has a pretty good idea what an individual reader is reading in the New York Times. They know that I'm reading a lot of stories about music and not a lot of stories about sports, so they probably think I'm a young woman. Okay, that, that's what they know. Google and Facebook know, I mean, they, they know what I had for breakfast this morning. The newspapers, you have to stand behind everything you publish. I can't imagine the libel threats you get. I get libel threats. I don't even have any money. You want to sue me, it's like, eh, have fun. But it, it, there, there's a tilt there. Companies that know more about their readers have an advantage in selling ads. CPMs, uh, cost per thousand per advertising, for everyone else is declining. At the same time, as a gatherer of news, you are bearing expenses that platforms do not bear. The competitive playing field is not even. How much of that problem is created by the absence of a lot of serious antitrust enforcement? How much is created by copyright? What the solution is, is is very difficult, but when you, when you talk about just how journalists understand it, people tend to see this as copyright and this as antitrust. People don't realize, even the people who cover these things, I have to, I have to say, and I'm, it's very complicated. People don't have a sense of how they interact, and, and it's, it's, um, it, it, it's a problem because they, they tend to see it as the issue of the day. This is antitrust, this is copyright. They don't really see how all of these things interact. I think it'd be real helpful if more newspapers spelled it out like that. There ought to be a page by the editorial that says, these are simple answers to your complicated question. And you didn't think of the question we did. Here are five questions, here are our five answers. That would be so helpful. I'm, my head is spinning just listening to you guys talk about all this stuff. What am I going to do when I go home tonight? Go to the copyright website. That's what I'm going to do. Well, I, I, um, the individual journalist working within a traditional news organization, I think you're right, is not. Um, but it is, there are the journalists who said, well, this model looks like it's not working out. Is there other models? So I think it's the journalists that just have decided to launch things like ProPublica or um, have decided you can make a living as a blogger if, if you've got a sort of niche area that you're an expert in. Um, uh, you know, Walt Mossberg used to review technology for the Wall Street Journal and then built up a huge audience. So I think there is this uh, knowledge that you can build up an audience and a brand as, as an individual reporter and then try to monetize that and copyright would be an important part of how you would do that. Um, but I think it doesn't solve the problem that we're all kind of collectively worrying about, which is the traditional, you know, more financially intensive organization. And I don't know that individual line journalists have changed their understanding that much because they're trying to be individual line journalists. Yeah, I would say, I mean, when, uh, particularly when I started as a journalist, the only understanding I had of copyright was that it would probably be fatal to my career if I copied somebody else's work and didn't properly attribute it. But I didn't even understand that to be copyright. I understood that to be plagiarism and that, you know, someone had been fired a few years ago for doing that and I better steer clear. Uh, you know, interesting, 
Lee, these days, I, I think journalists have a greater appreciation for it because they see the dwindling number of journalists being employed, particularly photojournalists, which is sad when you see the stunning work that, that you had up earlier and, and how beautiful that is. But I will say there's another issue of copyright, which we haven't touched upon, that, that we see a lot and is probably um, uppermost on, on journalists' mind, and that is when they engage in fair use. I would say most of the copyright questions I get, and we have 3,000 journalists and, uh, and one lawyer for copyright, me, so I get a lot of questions. I'm, m most of their concerns are about getting sued themselves. Uh, that's where their focus is because there are certain categories of, uh, of copyright holders that can be you know, very litigious and there are uh, certain uh, lawyers and firms that do nothing but bring copyright suits. There's one firm in the Southern District of New York in federal court in Manhattan, that is, that's brought about 600 uh, lawsuits within the last year, mostly aimed at media companies, just over what are perceived to be the uh, misuse of photographs or viral videos or those sorts of things. And so we're very focused on that. The Copyright Act, as many of you may know, provides for not only actual damages, what you can prove, what your license lost, which is usually a few hundred dollars, but also statutory damages, which is anywhere from $750 to $30,000 at the lower end, and perhaps up to $150,000 in, in egregious circumstances. So we're getting a lot of claims directed at us saying what you're doing is not fair use with respect to a video or a photo or even uh, print articles, and there's been a real cottage industry there. So, so when it comes to journalists, most of the questions I get are about avoiding being, being sued themselves. That, that's actually a big deal. I mean, I, I was joking about it earlier, but as a freelancer, you know, the, the, first of all, I mean, a lot of you who are attorneys, you wouldn't believe the freelance contracts you sign. I mean, you have all the legal responsibility for everything. They own the work in perpetuity for all media yet to be invented on any planet we've ever discovered. I mean, it's, the, you know, the, the contracts are brutal. And the legal responsibility matters. I mean, I, I, I cover, you know, I cover issues of law, so I, I may be more terrified than some. But, you know, I, I was, I, I guess a couple years ago, Billboard asked me to do a story on, on some actually copyright related fraud that had to do with music that had taken place in Singapore. And I literally said, you know, my, my impression, I could be wrong and I'm looking into it, is some of these former British territories have very libel laws that are very plaintiff friendly. And I said, I will not start that story unless you write me in the contract that you will stand behind me in the event that I get sued. And they said, do you really think you're gonna get sued? I was like, no, I don't think I'm gonna get sued, but I, I'd like to, you know, just in case you have the assurance on your end, why don't I have it on my end? You would have think they had asked if I could start going to meetings dressed in a Spider-Man costume. I mean, they, <laughs> they thought this was the craziest thing for anyone to ask for. It, it's a, it's a, Big deal. And you talk about journalists going out on your own, and I mean that, that is a solution that works for a lot of other people. It's scary out there, and if you want to defend your rights as a as a freelancer, that's that's scary too. I mean, so after I wrote the book, someone had uploaded it. This isn't a platform. Someone had uploaded it and was was giving it was giving it away. And I, I asked, I sent him an email. I said, hey, you know, could you take this down? The email came back, why? I said, well, you know, it, it's my book. I, I don't, I don't want to have the lawyer send you a note, Random House send you a note. Just, can you just take it down? I said, but people want to read it. I'm like, yeah, I get that. And, you know, if you want me to send you a copy, I'll send you a copy. You know, someone from Brazil was giving me a hard time on Twitter. We can't get the book in Brazil. I said, I'll send it to you. I probably shouldn't have said anything. It was like $20 to send it there by mail, but I did it. You know, it's very hard to defend to navigate all this stuff, to defend your rights. I don't want to get into this, but I think the CASE Act is interesting because it gives you a way to have lower stakes litigation, which will let freelancers and photojournalists defend their rights. Um, it, but it, it can be really terrifying. More and more journalists are, people don't talk about freelancers, but I wanted to, more and more journalism is done by freelancers and their legal protection in a lot of ways is just scary.
It's worse than scary. If you don't write your own deal, you're gonna forget something that they put in there. And if you sign their deal and you missed a corner of some dot or what's next, you're in trouble. So when they say, I'm gonna send you a contract, I say, you send the contract. But I'm sure I'm gonna rework it. And by now I've got out John Harrington's book, The Business of Photography, to protect me. And now that I know what the copyright office can do, I'm going to get them to help. <laughs> well, I, I, we're about to turn it over to uh, audience questions, so I'll give the mic runners a chance to get up. Uh, I will just do two things. One point of clarification, when Robert mentioned the CASE Act, this is the small claims bill uh, that is in uh, Congress right now, and it would make it uh, a lot easier to bring small claims rather than federal uh, claims uh, in federal court. Um, on the issue of freelancers, I actually did freelance my way through much of law school and it was, I think, one of the few people who get, can say they got paid to blog on a salary basis during law school. It was wonderful, but you mentioned sort of the, um, the terror of trying to navigate legal situations on your own and I I'm almost embarrassed to discuss what I used to think fair use meant and what my fair use best practices were. Uh, in my head. So I will say that the office has a nice resource for those who want to learn a little more about fair use and that's the overarching theme of all Copyright Matters events is public education. We have the fair use index on our website uh, and if you want to not get legal opinions but learn more about what courts have said is or is not fair use, check that out. If you're a uh, blogger you really might want to check out the Morell case um, because posting photos that appear on Twitter is not fair use. Um, so, with that, uh, can we get um, the audience questions? Yep. Yeah. Thanks for your presentation. My name is Li Yang. I just wonder how the Copyright Office handle the applicant's business. Is there any difference by the copyright papers form and the video form or online? Anything different? And how do you charge? And as yet, what content is, uh, should be copyrighted? Is that series should be applied individual edition, or is that should be all in the whole? Once you apply it once, it should be enough. I don't know that anyone up here has the answer to that question, but our public information office, or actually Whitney uh, Levandusky right behind you, could probably answer that. So if you afterwards just want to talk to Whitney, I think she could direct you in the right place. Y'all better I, take advantage of this, because it's not often all the people who run this place are all together. <laughs> hi. Hi, I'm Danielle Coffey with the News Media Alliance. Uh, Tom Curley uh, made a very good case for what's happening in the newspaper industry, and it's just very hard to monetize the content, especially when there's tremendous investment going into the investigative journalism behind it. Um, I wanted to ask the two gentlemen, I believe it's Jonathan and... Uh, and uh, Robert, or I'm sorry, and Michael. Uh, could you go, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the hot news doctrine and the INS case. And I was wondering if you think that that same theory applies to today, the technology that misappropriates content, what we can do about it if we could resurrect it, perhaps legislatively, how that would work and how it could protect the content that we have today. You want me, I, um, so, so, uh, the doctrine was created at a time when uh, uh, newspapers were not relying on copyright. Um, and, uh, but under the 1976 Act, um, the Congress has basically preempted state laws that are in conflict with, with copyright. Um, and so having a state law that prohibits copying facts um, would, would be in conflict, uh, it, it, the courts have said, except in the narrow narrow circumstance where those facts constitute quote unquote hot news. The particular case in the Second Circuit involved sports scores, um, but subsequent cases have really narrowed that doctrine and that's a matter of the way copyrights preemption is written right now. So you're right that in the absence of legislation, um, uh, there's very little the courts are likely to do to expand the hot news doctrine. And again, given that we're really talking about the, the advertising market, it's it strikes me that even a more robust hot news doctrine is unlikely to change the imbalance in power in the advertising market that we've heard about more. So I, I, I know I, I worry about the idea that more exclusive rights is going to get the 
news gathering organizations out of the financial squeeze that they're in because it, advertising was always such an important part of the business model and it's really these tectonic shifts in the way that people's attention are, are directed and, and news gatherers used to be the central point of attention in everybody's morning breakfast table and that's just changed um, until some new relationship between the platforms and the content providers can be developed. I, I don't think little tweaks like a hot news doctrine is likely to, to save anybody's uh, sort of uh, business model. I, I, I agree with what, with, with what Mike says, and I would just add that I think you know, different organizations have been able to find um, sort of n their niche and have been able to uh, 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 find a way to survive. Uh, it, it's a challenge. Uh, you know, the technology, um, it's, it's a very disruptive time, and you know, my, my business has been disrupted by technology. It used to be, when I uh, started out, that, that uh, a lot of my work was, a lot of my revenue was based on reporting, writing rep reporting on developments in copyright-related developments and reporting it on it to clients in Japan. And, you know, because they could rely on various you know, like, you know, the, the patent, trademark, and copyright journal, but that was, you know, that was a hard copy and it would come out, you know, once a week, whatever, and I was able to sort of fill that space in. I would write a report and fax it, right? That's how, and, and I would be able to beat them, beat the other report. Now you can't do that, right? There's all these online services, and so they're able to, you know, so I've had to do other things. It's, it's, it's disruptive, um, and it's challenging, but I think, uh, uh, in, in the news business, people have found ways. So, so for example, and this is a crazy example, but my, my parents moved from Los Angeles to here. They still have their funeral plots in Los Angeles. They want to sell them, right? They don't need them anymore. They want to be buried here. Well, it turns out that uh, the Los Angeles Jewish Journal has the monopoly on advertising for funeral plots. If you want to buy a funeral plot on the, the Jewish part of Forest Lawn service, you know, Forest Lawn, right, which is the, you know, the, the Mount Sinai, whatever, the place you advertise is the Jewish Journal. And so they make, and they charge a lot, by the way. But everyone knows if you want, and you'd think that there would be some online way. I was looking, well, isn't there some online market for funeral plots? No. At least, at least for Jewish you know, if you want to be buried in a Jewish cemetery, in the, the secondary market for funeral plots in L.A., the L.A. Jewish Journal, they have it locked up. If I can just throw in, that's the other disruption that we didn't talk about. Everyone's pointing their fingers at Google and Facebook and not at Craigslist. But remember, classified advertising was an important part of the revenue stream in newspapers, and it was Craigslist that essentially destroyed that revenue stream. Um, and so I just want to make sure people are aware of that piece of the disruption disruptive pie. I, I, I think that, you know, it's interesting. I mean, that, that, first of all, that's wild. <laughs> I, I'm at, to Jonathan, not to what you said. But, you know, there's a bunch of examples like that. I, I was talking a, a, about a job years ago. I, I didn't take it with a, a, a publication that ran a lot of, le you know, city and state legal notices, which, have, which I, I apparently ha in New York, I guess, have to be run in print, or they did have to be run in print. And, you know, I, I was looking at the health of this organization that I was thinking about working for, and it, you know, I, I, off the top of my head, I started to get the sense that this is about a fifth or a quarter of their business. At some point, that's going to end, probably sooner than later. And what you, the way disruption works, we tend to think, see these things going on a curve. Often they fall off a cliff. You know, the, the music business was I think decimated by piracy, but it didn't go gradually. It went store close, store close. The underlying cause was piracy. The proximate cause was if you wanted to buy a CD, there was nowhere to buy it. You know, right now the book business is doing pretty well, but its fortunes are very tied up in the fortunes of Barnes and Noble. God willing, they stay in business forever. But you know, you, you have these sort of clips, but I think one of the things that a lot of the advertising businesses are vulnerable. I think the future, like the whole idea that news is mainly supported by advertising is in danger. Selling content 
as wacky as it sounds to sell something to people that they might want to pay for, that could be the future. People say it's not reliable, but I don't think advertising is reliable either. Hey, thank you everyone so much for being here and lending your expertise. Um, so at the consumer level, as one who consumes news and is sifting through any search results or what's on the stand, some people are asking how do you get people to pay, other people are asking how do you ask people to pay. Um, and there's also this question of, you know, maybe a particular journal hasn't decided to go to a paywall yet or they have. So as a consumer of news or someone who knows consumers of news, how do you at the consumer level support a paper you like if they're still deciding what to do with changing technology or paywalls or if they're still figuring out their model, how do you as a consumer show effective support for a specific news outlet or writer? My favorite question ever. <laughs> do you have an answer? <laughs> no, I, it's, it's great that someone's asking that. I, I think signing up for a paywall, and honestly, there's a lot of publications, there's a lot of discussion about how do we get people to pay for news. I know one thing that's necessary but not sufficient, and that's charge. If you charge, I don't know that people will pay, but I know that if you don't charge, they certainly won't pay. If you know a publication that you like that's not charging, tell them to stop, start. I guarantee they'll be very surprised to get that email. These days you're very surprised if you get any email without profanity in it as a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> and it's rarely good job. But um, yeah, I, I think that that's really the future. I'm not bullish on paywalls in the sense that I think they're gonna work for everyone. But I think that as the advertising market continues to get concentrated on Google, in Google and Facebook, a lot of more publications are gonna to have to look into that. Some of them are gonna call it memberships, some of them are gonna call it donations, but what you're basically looking at is a paywall. Actually, what we have, we, we buy two uh, subscriptions, two print subscriptions to the Washington Post a year because you know, I take my copy to the office and my wife wants to have one when she goes off and she doesn't wanna to have to, we don't, wanna, we don't like to share. So, uh, so we, we, we pay for two subscriptions. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing to that, which is um, I get 11 newspaper, I'm sorry, 11 magazines, um, and I read none of them, basically. But I like all of them, and I want to make sure they stay around. There's just a stack um, by my bookcase in the fan room. It's just, you know, four feet tall of magazines. It's starting to look a little bit like I have a problem. But um, <laughs> the other thing is, the LA Times, I used to live in LA. I subscribed to the LA Times print for years. and. Um, about a year ago, they asked me if I wanted to, to subscribe to their digital edition. I never really read anymore because the news is fairly local or I'm reading it in the Washington Post. But for 99 cents a year, I signed up and I literally never even open it. But just, so to, just to add one more number of support. So I think that it is about, sometimes it is about, solidarity is the wrong word, but just sort of showing that you, you, know, you believe it's a good product and that you want to support it however you can. If we don't support the press, if we don't read, you're looking at a terrible dumbing down of all of us. And I pay for the Washington Post and the New York Times because both of them are still in such competition with each other, they steal each other's journalists. And so I like that, that's feistiness. Plus, <laughs> the more you read, the more you get the nuances of what's going on. I just read the story of what's going on in Philadelphia with the drawback epidemic over the weekend. The pictures are Fierce should scare everybody that drugs have gotten this far in our country. And a paywall is making me look at it. I'm telling my friends, you need to get, got a paywall. Pay for it anyway, is what I'm telling everybody. You must read, because everybody who doesn't want you to read, they're not good people. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Hi, uh, I'm Karen Morangi. I work at Relex, which is the parent company of LexisNexis and Elsevier. So we use news, we create news, we love news. Um, and I wanted to thank the Copyright Office for putting together this terrific panel. I also just wanted to shout out to folks in the room who are uh, perhaps on the up curve of learning about copyright. Um, I'm on, uh, I'm, we're a member of the Copyright Alliance, 
And they also have, in addition to the Copyright Office, tremendous uh, information, very user-friendly information. You can just go to copyrightalliance.org. Um, they've revamped their website in the last few years, even gotten an award. So I just want to do a shout out and, and thank the Copyright Office for doing this today. Thank you. We still have time for one more question, if there is one. I'll end on a disruptive note. Um, Josh Kaufman. Um, so many of the disruptive technologies that we've seen have been premised on illegal uh, basis. You started with Napster in the music field. Um, we just have the Music Modernization Act because Spotify and Pandora all were acting illegally without getting the proper uh, compulsory licenses. The news aggregators like Google News and others basically have been sued uh, because they are not fair uses and they're using all of um, you know, the other technology, and I guess it's more of a comment, you know, talking about, you can license these things. There's no reason that you can't have a proper license from the creative folks. The musicians are getting killed. It takes 320,000 streams on Spotify to pay for what a band would make on one album. You talk to professional photographers, how many of them are still in business today because of these things? You have this rampant musicians, filmmakers, Prints, limited edition prints, all the publishers are out of business because people have the mentality that if it's online, it should be free. It's all fair use. The whole copy left, which I would like to call the copy theft, concept is so destructive to the creative people in our country. And there is a simple, simple solution. The users should license it. You should negotiate it, be it compulsory licenses, consensual licenses. There's no reason at all that the creative parties can't have proper licensing by the users. And everybody wins. They have their content, it's made available throughout, and the creative citizens of the world get paid. So. If we could get people out to meetings after seven o'clock or after work to talk about being a journalist, to talk about being a, a photojournalist, we could band together and start to talk about the things that are good for all of us the most difficult thing now is, at least for my friends, is they don't want to come out after dark. Oh, by the way, this program is running on Netflix. Flix. They're going to sit up at the computer and watch this stuff. It's not helping the progress of how we are as a community. And especially if you're doing intellectual stuff. You've got to hang out with intellectual people so you can guard each other, teach each other, embrace kids to come into what you're doing because you know what you're doing is so cool. But if you don't bring kids in, if you don't meet as a group, if you think television comes ahead of doing decent human stuff, then we're all gonna lose. So I don't want that. I go out every night, we're gonna meet about what? I'm there. Television is not the answer. But what is the answer is reading. If you read online, you can read 24 hours a day. Those prime hours between 6 and 11 o'clock, go out, talk to your friends about what's going on with copyright, and your businesses as a writer, a producer of intellectual content. Otherwise, yeah, it's going to get swiped. That's how it works. I think in the, in the case of music, I, I generally agree with you. I think there are, there are cases when it's not that easy there are cases when it's not that easy to get the licenses. Um, it, it should be easier and it will be easier. Um, but I generally, t I generally take your point. Yeah, I, I guess my just overall high level rebuttal, and you know, there's, there's uh, many things I agree with what you're saying, but I, I think we also have to just sort of step back and look at the, the bigger picture. And I, you know, I know, you know, Robert and others on this panel might disagree with me, but that if you look at the at the big picture, um, you know there's there is more music being created now than ever before. There are more movies being created there than ever before. There are more books being created than ever before, and I suspect that there's actually more news organizations than ever before. Uh, and a lot of that is because the costs of production and distribution have dropped so dramatically because of the internet. Now, yes, it does create dis disruptions for existing businesses. But there's a lot of new businesses, and there's a lot of new creators, and a lot of new voices. 
And so eventually an equilibrium will be established. I mean, we were, Sharon and I were talking before, you know, about how it used to be so hard to be, you know, a, a photographer needed to, you know, knew, know how to develop, you know, his or her own film, right? I mean, you don't have to do that anymore. I mean, the barriers to entry into the photography profession are, are, are incredibly low, and that, that's harder for, you know, the more established photographers. But this is, you know, it, was it progress? I don't know. But it is, uh, uh, we do need to recognize that, uh, that there is, you know, there, there, there's, there's, there's a trade-off, uh, and that some people are uh, hurt, but other people are uh, benefited, and, and but, but the bottom line is, is that there is more creativity, more, more creative activity now than ever before, and all of us really believe that we are creators, right? As with, with all our photographs and all of our blogging, and you know, we're all, we're all participating in a way that we never were able to before. Sorry, I don't. I, I guess I, I agree with what you said. There is, but I think that like there is a lot more photography being created because it's easier to take pictures. There's a lot more music being created because it's a lot cheaper to make an album. You you, you can make an album on on Pro Tools. It's a lot easier to make a film because you can shoot it on an iPhone. How good it looks is another story. Like I want to think that we can appreciate that and honor that, because it does make the world better when we're all creators, that we can take what's good about that technology and also say, hey, just because it's easy to make an album doesn't mean you shouldn't pay for someone else's. Just because it's easy to take your own photo doesn't mean you shouldn't properly license someone else's when you have to and it's not fair use. That's not very catchy. But you get the idea. You know, it, you know, one of the things that happens, you know, people do this and it's so easy and it seems easy, but you know, I've taken thousands of pictures on my iPhone. They don't look like her photos. It's not because I wasn't in the same rooms. It's because I'm not a photographer. I'm a guy pointing my phone at something. And, and I, I guess I want to think we can have it both ways, if, if that makes sense. Well, no, it's certainly, and and no one's uh, saying that you know copyright should be abolished or disrespected or whatever. All, my my point is is that to the extent that we're talking about sort of chain making changes to the law, we have to say well ultimately what is the purpose of the law, right? And it's to promote the progress of science and useful arts, and at some point we're sort of say well is there a shortage of art being created and even very good art being created, right? I mean. There's, there's, uh, uh, you know, yes, there are probably far more bad photographs being taken now than at any point in human history, no doubt. I mean, I just came back from a weekend vacation and I took a lot of bad photographs, you know. But I will say that when I looked at, at my photographs uh, from the same place, I was in Portugal, but I was also there, you know, 10 years ago, and I looked at my photographs, they're better just because an iPhone really does take much better photographs than you know whatever I was using 10 or 15 years ago. But, but the point is, is that, yes, there's a lot more bad music being produced, but there's also a lot more good music being produced, and a lot of it has to do with changing business models and the disintermediation. I mean, it's a, it's a very complicated story, but you know, also what you were talking about before, but you know, the, the, the enemy of the freelancer is not the end user who may be copying, right? Maybe he's an enemy to some extent. I mean, the enemy of the freelancer is the publisher that you're dealing with, right? Who's taking advantage of you. And, and that is, and that's, you know, so, so the technology is allowing disintermediation. Oh, man, I feel like that everyone is. <laughs> 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 but it's allowing disintermediation, which, again, has strong points, bad points. I mean, it's, you know, maybe it's, you know, for the middleman, the media company in, in the middle, it's more challenging, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity, and it's just a matter of figuring out how to take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah, I guess I feel enemy is a strong word, because they're, they're paying me, but not as much as I would like, so I guess that makes them a friend of me. You know, on the one hand, I want to negotiate with them aggressively. On the other hand, I want them to you know, they need to have enough money that, you know, I want, I want a, a bigger slice of the pie and so do they, but I, 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 enemy is a strong word, but 
there's also a sense that, you know, there's not as much pie to fight over. Is anyone else hungry? <laughs> it's, I can't sort of differ, it's hard to differentiate between the two. You know, the news organizations have less money on advertising. It's harder to negotiate them with, it's harder to negotiate with them because of that. And the terms are bad. It, 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 it's hard to separate all that out. Well, thank you guys. I wanted to thank all of our panelists. We've had a really great panel discussion and talk about journalism and copyright. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to anyone after this. Our next event is going to be about the public domain in January, so please keep tuned for that. And please join me in thanking all of our panelists for their great discussion today. Thank you.